This is part two in my advanced optimization series using the 2014-2015 Science Olympiad Division B rules. I will show my first build and talk a little bit about how I got to that first build. Then I will outline the process I like to use when optimizing any device and how it applies to this bridge. And finally, I'll show the test results from this initial build and talk about the next steps. Here's my first build for this exercise, and you will see at the end of this video it actually performed very well. The whole idea of this series is to take a very good design and squeeze the final 20 to 30 percent performance out of it to compete at the highest level. But how exactly did I come up with this bridge in the first place? Although the title of this video talks about being the first build, this is really more like my 95th build of a bridge like this. While it's true that this is my first build using the 2014-2015 rules, I started coaching the season a year later and the bridge rules were very similar. The only real difference was that there was no 5 cm width restriction and one end of the bridge needed to be elevated 5 cm using an extra loading block. That means almost everything our team learned that season could be applied to what I'm trying to do here. I thought it might be interesting to show how our design changed throughout the season. I'm sure that many teams find themselves somewhere along the same learning progression as we were back then, going from knowing almost nothing about the event to eventually being very competitive by the end of the year. This was actually the first bridge I ever built way back in October of 2015. As you can see, it's a bit crazy as I tried using something like an aircraft wing cross-section support. It didn't do very well weighing in at 7.86 grams and holding only 4.82 kilograms for an efficiency of 613. One thing that I still find interesting about this first build is even then I realized it would be important to be able to make both sides as identical as possible. I used two sheets of balsa clamped together and carved out the profile and holes together so they would be as similar as possible. It's too bad I'm still thinking that this was more like a 2D loading problem like the theory would predict and didn't have nearly enough lateral supports. The same day I built my first stick based bridge. I believe I just drew out something on graph paper and glued it together. While beating the score of the aircraft wing bridge it didn't do much better with a score of 773. About a month later our team started to build bridges based on the template that was available for download from the official Science Olympiad folks. This bridge was well built and probably the first one we had that held more than 15 kilograms, but it was very heavy at almost 16 grams for a competition score of 947. For what it's worth, this is probably the relative level of performance you could expect from the current template design floating around for the 2021-2022 rules. Generally, not very competitive. To prove that point a bit, three bridges and 11 days later, this is a somewhat optimized version of that template design. It had a better efficiency of 966, but it was obvious that this design wasn't ideal. This brings up one of my first extremely important points. Don't do too much optimization while you are still learning what works as a good design. I could have spent months tweaking this design and built dozens of bridges, but at the end of the day, it still wouldn't have been competitive. Another 11 days and we looked at an even more simplified version of that previous bridge. These were very simple to build and were able to get close to a thousand efficiency. We had definitely learned how important it was to have sufficient cross bracing at this point, even with the simple beam design. About two weeks later we had a major breakthrough. This was our first attempt at a triangular bridge, something that really didn't look like a conventional bridge at all, but it turns out it was a great design for these rules. I believe I learned about this by reading in online forums and seeing a picture of something similar. Just two builds and six days later, with some basic optimizations, we had our first real efficiency of over 2500 and a competition score of nearly 2100. This was a huge deal and came several weeks before our first invitational that season, so we were able to start building very competitive devices from this point forward. All the previous build experience the students had with building inferior designs would pay off now as they had no problem building this style device. Now you can see it's taking many more builds to gain just a little bit in efficiency. It took 14 more builds to get this 6.89 gram bridge to score 2164. This was our next breakthrough bridge. You can see it was 33 builds and about six weeks later. The big step happened when we went to a competitive invitational and observed that the winning bridge was narrow. For me, this was an out of the box thinking moment. Until then, I had just assumed it would be best to be around five centimeters wide if you wanted to support a five centimeter loading block. 
That was definitely not the case, and it took seeing it in action for me to realize what that kind of simple idea could do. Here is a 4.4 gram bridge scoring 2859. That design change was so exciting, it only took two more builds before we got our first efficiency and competition score of over 3000. And finally, here is my build number 94. It was 4.59 grams and it held 15.66 kilograms for a real efficiency of over 3400 and a competition score of 3268. Our best student build that year was around 2800 and placed fifth at states. We were extremely happy with those results as it was 11 places better than the team had scored the previous year. It took me 94 builds as a coach, almost six months, and something like six major design changes to go from a score of 613 to 3268. It really goes to show you, you need to be flexible with your designs and always be willing to learn new things along the way. Okay, that was a lot of history, but now I think you can see where the inspiration came for this first build. It is pretty much just a five centimeter wide version of that earlier build, but now I know about using basswood for the tension members and using three thirty-second inch thick wood for the legs. Now it's time to talk about the approach I like to take when optimizing any of these devices. I like to group functional parts of the device together to see if it's possible to optimize them independently or at least semi-independently. One of the most straightforward examples of independent optimization is with Boomilever. Here is a picture of a typical boomy. The design here doesn't matter so much as just to know that there is fundamentally a compression part to the design, colored here in blue, and a tension part shown in red. The nice thing with this device is that those major components, especially the difficult to build wall hook joint, are basically completely independent of one another. So much so that we actually tested different hook joint designs and did some basic preload testing on just the tension part totally outside of a complete build. This had the advantage that it only took 10 to 15 minutes to build a tension piece compared to maybe an hour for the compression part. We would make sure we had a well tested tension part before installing it on a more complex compression piece. At the other end of the spectrum is something like this tower. It is symmetric in two dimensions and the entire goal is to deal with the compression loading and prevent buckling in the legs. To that end, the legs, colored red here, and all the cross members act completely together and it would be almost impossible to optimize these things independently. As you change the mass of the legs, the buckling strength changes, which requires a different set of optimal cross members and materials. Towers that year was a lot of fun, but it took a lot of work to iterate on a good solution. I would say bridges in general fall somewhere between these two extremes, with some parts being fairly independent from one another and some highly dependent. Before I show the pretty colored pictures of the bridge groups, I wanted to share my notebook page from the first build. The numbers themselves don't matter too much, but more the concept that I'm grouping them together in four categories, and those four groups account for everything in the bridge. The groups are the legs, all the cross bracing, the top leg connector, and finally the bottom tension members. To choose a reasonable starting point in terms of materials, I basically worked backwards. I knew something like this design should be able to achieve around a 4,000 efficiency. That means the entire mass needed to be 3.75 grams. As you can see from the top part of these notes, I started with the tension pieces where I knew a 1 16th by 1 16th basswood would be around 0.76 grams. I measured out 14 7 centimeter cross members of the material I wanted to use for that and it was 0.4 grams. That left 2.6 grams for all four legs and the top combined. That allowed me to pick material from my library. In this case, it was normalized to a length of 30.5 centimeters that would be right where it needed to be when cut down to the proper size. I recorded the actual mass of the final parts before assembly. The legs were 2.33 grams, the cross members were 0.4 grams, the top 0.19 grams, and the tension members were 0.82 grams. If you add all that up, it comes to 3.74 grams. As you can see, my final as-built mass was 3.88 grams, so there was at least 0.14 grams of glue in this build, and really slightly more as the final bridge gets some parts sanded off. Realistically, there was probably about 0.2 grams of glue in this build. That is always something you want to be aware of when building these light devices. You want to use enough glue, but not too much as it does add measurable weight to your device. Now I'll show the optimization groups I'm using for the bridge. 
Here is the final completed bridge, which I'll paint different colors to show the various groups. First is the top part of the sides that holds the legs together. These might be the most independent part of the entire design. Next are the legs which take most of the mass of the bridge. There are plenty of ways to try and optimize the legs, but as we'll find out, similar to the tower we saw earlier, the legs are highly dependent on the cross bracing. The next extremely important group is the tension members. More than any other component of the bridge, these pieces are under pure tension, which allows for some interesting optimization opportunities. Finally are the cross members. This is only the initial design I chose, which is an over-under design. Later this will change, but the concept of optimizing this functional group together never changes. In future parts of this series, I'll be referring to these groups and showing my notes as I try to optimize all of these components. The next major important point is that to achieve the most ideal optimization for any design, you want an extremely balanced design. That means when your device fails, every single component should be close to failing. If you have any single piece or group that is overbuilt and too strong, that is just extra mass that you could have removed and achieved a better score. Okay, let's finally see how this device performed during testing. Here it was 3.86 grams coming out of my dry box, which at the time wasn't working well. I fixed that later in the process, but that really doesn't matter for this first build. If you've seen any of my other videos, you're probably familiar with this setup. I am loading sand in the funnel at the left of the screen and it's going through the PVC pipe and into the bucket. I have a custom built load cell that dynamically measures the weight and retains the maximum value. So it's not important to stop the sand loading when the device breaks like in a regular competition. The load cell does not measure the dead weight above the bucket. So it's necessary to account for the mass of the loading block, chain and the load cell itself when computing the final mass held. For all these tests, that is 140 grams. You may notice that I'm loading the sand fairly quickly. In my experience, it's much more important to limit the time your device is under the maximum load than to worry about any extra effects of the fast loading. Here is the high speed footage of the test. I'll freeze the video right at the point of failure as it's really handy to be able to see the exact point and method of how it happened. In this case, the leg buckled inward at almost the exact halfway point. This would imply the need for stronger legs or better cross bracing. We'll investigate those ideas in the next parts of the series. This bridge held just over 13.5 kilograms for a competition score of 3506. That's actually a very good result and would have placed fourth at nationals, but it's still quite a ways from the top scores. I understand that not many people will have access to a 5000 frame per second high speed camera to do this kind of analysis and for all my actual coaching years I never had this camera either. But I did try and record the test as best as possible to try and learn what happened. Phones these days can do a pretty decent job of high speed video so I'd recommend you record all your tests from as many angles as possible as you try and learn about what is happening. Stay tuned for the next several parts of this series as I show exactly what I did to try and improve the result. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to my channel if you like this kind of content.